ya.
kan uh, kalau kan ada tuh Uh, hello everyone and welcome to today's public lecture titled The Development of Choice of Law and Forum from Transnational Business Law Perspective. And today's public lecture is a series of online public lecture held by the Transnational Business Law Department, Faculty of Law Universitas Pajajaran. And we will be focusing on the current development of uh, crucial issues regarding to the choice of law and the choice of forum based on tra transnational law uh, perspective. And... Uh, uh, my name is Mursal uh, Maulana. I am the lecturer and researcher from the Faculty of Pajajaran, and today I'm in charge to be the moderator to this uh, public lecture. Before embarking on to the first sessions, uh, our dean, uh, Dr. Idris SHMA, has joined with us today, and uh, he will give the opening remarks for this today's public lecture. To Dr. Idris SHMA, uh, the floor uh, is yours, Prof. Dr. Idris? Yep. Okay, the screen is yours, Pak. Perhaps you can unmute first, Pak. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, in the name of Allah, Mas Gracious, Mas Merciful. Praise be to Allah, the Serisor and the Sustainer of the Wood. So uh, welcome uh, to our public and uh, public law, and of course uh, everybody. Uh, good morning, and also special good morning for special uh, guest lecturer from. Uh, Yunjo, so thank uh, so much, uh, Prof. Yunjo, because you are uh, you are you, you have a uh, very busy, but now you, you can share your um, your topic to our uh, student. Okay, uh, the topic is uh, uh, how to develop uh, a private international law, and also the focus uh, will will be uh, shared by uh, Prof. Jo is. Uh, choice of law and uh, and forum. This international uh, public uh, lecture uh, organized by the Department of uh, Transnational Business Law. So thank and success for the department. This is part of our how to uh, develop our faculty. And good luck and welcome my student, my college. Here uh, I can see uh, some my college. Yeah, I did see by you and of course uh, my stakeholder from anywhere from uh, any university as we know that uh, prop yun jo is a representative of regional office for asia and pacific and also uh, you are expert at the the uh, conference on private oh, and uh, you are uh, not only a great lecturer but also you are a practitioner and arbitrator in so many cases of international dispute uh, arbitration. Of course, uh, I remember uh, Prof. Jo, uh, who is the best one, who is the great uh, professor, who is the, 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 the most important uh, contributor for the, the subject, uh, private international law. He is uh, the late uh, Prof. Dr. Mutar Kusmat Maja. He died uh, four months ago, and our faculty, uh, is uh, is uh, developed by by him and uh, we are the the people of him and of, of course my student of course uh, strictly uh, remember that he is uh, the best one writer in our uh, subject uh, especially private in the solo he distinguishes uh, what is uh, public and uh, private in the solo but we forget the public we are uh, focused on profit. Mutak uh, the uh, said that bill, a private international law, is uh, composed of a legal norm and a principle which regulate a civil relationship across that border or the law that govern individual relationship uh, or connection based on their own uh, national law with the uh, foreign aspect. While Jesup said that uh, he referred uh, the term transnational law, yeah, because transnational law include all law which regulate uh, action or even that transcend national border, both public and private international law are included. And of course, so many instruments also uh, released by the Hague Conference on uh, Private National Law, as I know that at least 30 uh, international uh, instruments including uh, 20 convention, three protocol, one model law, and one uniform document. Also, uh, in uh, more recent years, the, the Hague uh, also has uh, so many important uh, international document uh, uh, relating to international uh, uh, private law. So uh, welcome back, welcome again, because this is great uh, international public law. And of course, uh, my student, will take the advantage yeah, for the subject because uh, this is relevant with our uh, studies. Yeah, We have a department of uh, uh, civil law, department of uh, private law, and uh, one of the subject is uh, international private law or, or uh, private uh, international law. So, uh, of course, I'm as the dean, hope uh, my student uh, will develop more about the subject. And uh, many alumni told me that uh, my dean, uh, please, uh, uh, you educate your, your student to be next uh, international lawyer. So in this moment, we know that Pak Jokowi 
will uh, is looking for the international lawyer. So, so I, I hope one time the position will be uh, fulfilled by my next student. So uh, thanks, Prof. Injo. I hope this uh, first uh, international public lecture will be uh, collaborated, will be continued by my uh, college, uh, Bu Prita, Pak Mursa, and other international uh, transnational uh, business law lecturer. Because uh, I said that no state will be big, big, big state without transnational business, without transnational uh, economic, and without transnational uh, trade. So the, the, the state like Indonesia, I'm sure that will be bring a big country, and Indonesia is one of the 20 uh, group uh, 20. So it is a good uh, partner for us. Uh, and then we can begin from the study of the subject. And I hope, of course, my student will take uh, everyone, everything for the subject. And of course, uh, you are uh, the next my Indonesia. Yeah. Again, thanks so much, my uh, college, Professor Yonjo, Obrita, Pak Mursal, and my college from anywhere. Good luck. Enjoy the, the lecture. And of course, uh, this is also good for uh, final assignment uh, of my student. And uh, and keep uh, healthy, keep uh, spirit for my student, because Indonesia in, in, in the world is in your hand. Thank you again. Good luck. Enjoy the lecture. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good luck. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dean Idris, for your opening uh, remarks. And uh, to uh, we totally agree with you, uh, Dean Idris. This topic is quite uh, timely and dynamic so that this opportunity must be uh, utilized by students uh, by uh, following uh, this uh, session of the public lecture. And fortunately, uh, fortunately enough, today uh, has joined with us Professor Yanzo. Uh, Professor, I hope you are uh, going, uh, doing uh, okay in these current circumstances. And this is such a great honor for us. And uh, thank you for accepting uh, our invitation to this public lecture. And uh, for the sake of the good order, please allow me to provide uh, the summary of uh, Professor Yunzo. Professor Yunzo is uh, Henry Chang Professor in International Law and Head of the Department of the at Law uh, at Hong Kong, uh, at University of Hong Kong. And uh, he received a PhD from uh, Erasmus University, Rotterdam, and obtained a Master of Law from the Leiden University and a Bachelor of Law from the China University of the Political Science and Law. And Professor Zhao is currently the representative of the Regional Office for the Asia Pacific, ROAP, of the Hague Conference on the Private International Law. And he also standing uh, standing counsel member of the Chinese Society in International Law and Council member of Chinese Law Society. And uh, Professor Zhou also uh, arbitrator in several international arbitration commissions. And he has published widely on, on various uh, topics, including particular dispute resolution and space law. This is the, 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 the profile of the uh, Professor Yun Zhou. Without further ado, uh, Professor uh, Yun Zhou, this is uh, your time to present uh, to the public lecture. And uh, this is the screen is yours, Prof. Uh, perhaps you can unmute first. Oh, it doesn't work. Uh, Taufik, could you help? Yes, I think it's done. Yeah, yep. Thank you. I hope you can hear me now. Yeah, we can hear you, Prof. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair, I think for your very kind introduction. And of course, I think I would like to thank the Dean, Professor Dr. Idris, I think for the very kind, very warm, uh, welcoming remarks. I think, thank you so much. I think it really brings me back to my uh, sweet memory when I studied in Leiden University. Uh, so I think that's really a, a great experience for me. And I'm uh, pleased, I think, to have the opportunity today, I think, to give the uh, lecture. Uh, it is a great honor for me uh, because I think in the last two years, I think because of the pandemic, I think it really have not a lot of travels, but it's always good uh, to meet online. I think the, the students, the teachers, colleagues, etc. So uh, thank you. So um, 
Today, I think, uh, as the Dean has mentioned, I will talk about the development of choice of law and forum from transnational law perspective. So before I start, uh, let me share my points with all of you. Uh, can you see the PowerPoints now? Yep, we can see it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so um, as a chair, and the dean has already mentioned that uh, I'm uh, now a, uh, the professor at the University of Hong Kong, but also I'm also taking the role of representative as a Hague Conference on Private International Law. Uh, this is one very interesting area that I would like to share with you. And nowadays, the transnational legal issues are coming up. And what can we do? What, how can we resolve these type of disputes to come up with a harmonious society? I think that's the really something we are looking to. So today I would like to uh, talk about three areas. One is, uh, of course, I will uh, introduce to you to the Hague Conference on Private International Law as a intergovernmental organization. So uh, this is, of course, my duty as a representative of the HCCH. Then I will look at the choice of law issue and also the choice of court or choice of forum issue. So I think these are the two areas that actually are very, rather important. And the HCCH, the Hague Conference on Private International Law, has done a lot in the past few decades in these two fields. So this is a very important occasion to look into what the HCCH has done and what kind of uh, documents have been concluded through years of development. Now, when we look at the HCCH, we have the English name Hague Conference on Private International Law. But at the same time, we have the French name. So for ease of memory, it's always good to pick up some very easy letters to demonstrate. So that's why we pick up the HCCH from the English title and the French title. So that's a region of the name of HCCH. Now, what is HCCH? It is rather important to define the legal status of HCCH. It is an intergovernmental organization with legislative function, which dates back to 1893. Few years back in 2018, in Hong Kong, we organized a major event to celebrate the 125th anniversary of the organization. So the left side, you can see the photos here. There are some celebrations in 2018. Now we are waiting for our 130th anniversary of the organization. The most important task of the HCCH is to work towards progressive unification of the rules of private international law. Of course, we know that Unification is rather difficult. Different countries have different considerations due to the background, the culture. So that's why sometimes we use the harmonization, which appears to be much more useful or realistic. But the HCCH provides the legal framework for the international society to come up with a uniform framework to deal with civil and commercial activities. So far, the HCCH develops and adopts 
hate conventions and protocols. So if we look at the website of the HCCH, we can see there are altogether 39 conventions plus one soft law instrument. Conventions means this kind of hard law, which are binding once you become a member to the convention. Soft law instrument is actually something I would like to discuss with you today. That is one document which will not be binding. It only gives guidance, suggestions, recommendations. You are free to adopt. So that's a soft law document which deals with the international commercial contracts regarding the choice of law. If we divide the conventions and protocols into various areas, largely speaking, we have three areas of the conventions and protocols. One is the international civil procedure and legal cooperation. For example, the documents that I would like to discuss with you is the choice of court convention which deals with the choice of forum. So this falls within the first pillar. The second area, we have conventions in the international family law and child protection. And lastly, we have the conventions and protocols in the field of international commercial law and financial law. The HCCH has been very practical in dealing with all these issues, tries to make rules to resolve real problems, which of course aims to bring direct benefits to the member states. Now we look at the three areas of conventions protocols, largely speaking, the HCCH try to resolve four areas of legal issues. The first one is a jurisdiction, second, applicable law, and third, recognition and enforcement. These three areas are the traditional areas that we are looking to. Jurisdiction, of course, we talk about the court, which court shall have the jurisdiction. The authorities of which state are competent to decide on the questions arising from a cross-border situation. That's a transnational uh, issues, how to define on the appropriate court. And the second area is applicable law, which deals with the law of which state applies to a cross-border situation. And the third, recognition and enforcement which deals with the judgment issue. So how can judgments or decisions of a state be recognized or enforced abroad? So these are the three traditional areas for private international law, which falls within the scope of Hague Conference on Private International Law. That means we encourage member states to cooperate in a legal field in a judicial means. But slowly, we realize that judicial cooperation is not enough. Sometimes we should also emphasize about the administrative cooperation. So that's a fourth pillar that came up later on. It deals with the issue of how can authorities better cooperate to improve efficiency and overcome the obstacles arising in cross-border situations. We are not simply talking about judicial authorities, but we are looking at the administrative authorities. How can the government cooperate? How can the government bring the benefits to the citizens, the real person? So these are the four pillars that we have developed in the last few decades. to make sure that the HCCH does not deal with substantive law. So we only deal with 
the choice floor, conflict floor, rules, etc., nothing to do with the substantive law. Instead, it builds bridges across legal system, including civil law, common law, Sharia law, respecting the legal diversity. I still remember a few weeks ago when I uh, discussed with some officials um, in the ASEAN countries, we talk about the family issues. They really emphasize about the Sharia law, Islamic law, et cetera. So we have made it very clear that we are not looking into the substantive law, the rights and duties of the citizens. We try to bridge the gap across legal system. So that's the major aspect we have been working very hard in the last few decades. When it comes to the HCCH members, so far we have 90 HCCH members, including 89 countries and one intergovernmental or the economic integration organization, which is the European Union, European Union. So altogether 90. Uh, but very soon we will have more countries coming in. Some new, some countries which have newly joined include, for example, we have Namibia in January this year, Thailand March this year, Mongolia July this year, Honduras September 2021. So I think the uh, membership is really uh, expanding. If we look at the development of the HCCH, 43 new members since. 2000, so which take up 48% of the membership, including 16 new members from Asia. So here we have the Thailand, Mongolia, etc. Apart from uh, the member states, actually there are also non-member states which are connected with HCCH. So we have 66 non-HCCH members that is a contracting party or signatory to at least one hate conventions or in the process of becoming a member. So with 90 members and 66 non-HCCH members, we have altogether 156 states connected with HCCH. So for example, when we talk about Indonesia, uh, before I re uh, really uh, uh, prepare for this uh, the slides for the presentation uh, lecture today, I uh, actually look at the situation in, in Indonesia. Indonesia is not yet a member to HCCH, but it's rather important to see this month. Indonesia deposited its instrument of accession to the Apostille Convention on 5th October 2021. So just a few weeks back, uh, I can show you the photos, which here you can see uh, the Indonesia has become a member to the HCCH Apostille Convention. So this is a breakthrough for the relationship between Indonesia and uh, HCCH. And that's a very important starting point to strengthen, to develop, the relationship between the HCCH and Indonesia. Of course, in the end, we really hope to see that Indonesia is a member of the HCCH, not only the a member to the convention, but of course that is already a big step. Uh, now, if we look at the member uh, and also the presence of the HCCH, the headquarter, the main office is in The Hague, the Netherlands. So we have the main office of the permanent bureau, we always say the PB in uh, The Hague. Then there are two regional offices, one in Latin America in Buenos Aires, so which was set up in 2005. That's the first regional office. Then the second regional office was set up in Hong Kong, that's an Asia Pacific regional office in 2012. Let me show you a little bit about the building of the regional office for Asia and the Pacific here. Your left side, you can see the photo here. This is a new building uh, or heritage building in Hong Kong. Formerly, this building has been serving as the court of final appeal um, for many years. 
and we call this building as a French mission building. So it uh, has been in existence for many years as a heritage building. Uh, last year, uh, in October last year, so that one year before, we moved to this building and this becomes a permanent office for the regional office uh, of the HCCH. Uh, the regional office opened in 2012 with mission to act as a bridge to enhance communications and understanding between the PB of the HCCH in The Hague and the states in the Asia Pacific region. The purpose of the organization or the region office is to promote hate conventions and build networks within the region and to facilitate good practice and consistent implementation of the conventions. So I hope that in future, you will have the chance to visit this building. Um, it's a heritage building with a lot of interesting uh, setup within the building. Now, if we look at the main activities of the HCCH, there are normative work and the post-convention work. Normative work includes research. So we do research, identifies legal needs within mandate. We also make proposals to see whether we need to make new instruments. And furthermore, if there's a need, then we will set up a working group to have expert discussion and negotiation to make sure that the documents can be well accepted by the member states in the diplomatic sessions. So which uh, we, you can see the drafting process can lead to the adoption of new instruments, either conventions, protocols, or soft law. After the adoption of the conventions, then of course the HCCH will need to promote the documents we will need to monitor, review the operation of the documents. We also publish some guidance, guides to good practice, handbooks, and also, if needed, the HCCH can also provide the post-convention assistance to make sure that the convention is, implement is implemented in a proper manner. So far, we have a look at what has been done. If we look at the document itself, we have three pillars, which have already very briefly mentioned. One area is the protection of children, international matrimonial and family relations. The second is a judicial and administrative cooperation and litigation. And lastly, we have commercial and financial law. Uh, for today, uh, I will largely concentrate on the two documents. One, which you will find out in a green column. Green column, we have the 2015 choice of law principle. So that's something I would like to discuss with you. And the second document I will discuss with you in a, a deep blue color. You can see the 2005 choice of court convention, which deals with the choice of forum issue. So these are the two issues, uh, conventions that I would like to uh, have further discussions later on. The Hague Conventions has two major purpose. One is to facilitate international trade, commerce, and foreign direct investment. So for example, we do have a postule service of process, taking of evidence, access to justice, choice of court judgments, security convention, and hate principles, et cetera, which can provide legal certainty and predictability and establish uniform global standards, leading to a climate more conducive to cross-border trade and investment. And second, very important regarding the human rights issue, especially in area of child protection, child abduction, adoption, support, et cetera. These conventions can give effect to fundamental principles expounded in a 1989 UN Convention on the Rights of the Children, Right of the Child, and also some other human rights documents. So these are the two benefits which can be brought to the member states by the HCCH conventions. If we look at the PB, Permanent Bureau, uh, the 
right side or the left side, I do put on some photos here to give you some general ideas about the functioning or operation of the organization. At the permanent bureau, the budget is not very high. So you can see that uh, budget, annual budget of the organization is 4.1 million euro. And the staff in the PB, fewer than 30 permanent members. For smaller contexts, for meetings, for experts and working groups or standing committee, up to 40 participants, the meetings can be held at the permanent bureau. So that's a photo you can see from the right up side, upper right side. If that's a major meetings, so they, uh, the event can be taken place at the Hague Academy building. So that's a Peace Palace. I'm sure many of you have heard about this building uh, in the city center of the Hague. Large context for plenary style meetings, uh, including the special commissions, council on general affairs, council of diplomatic representatives, diplomatic sessions, etc. Up to 300 participants can really uh, joins meeting in this major manual, venue, major venue. So in the end, basically we upheld or promote the international cooperation and consensus across all HCCH meetings. With the brief introductions to the HCCH, then we quickly move to the choice of law issues. Choice of law is very important. In the transnational background, when we look at the transnational planning in cross-border trade and investment, if we would like to conduct trade and investment, normally, first of all, we will have to think about what kind, what kind of dispute resolution mechanism we are going to use. There are various types of dispute resolution mechanism, include negotiation, mediation, arbitration, and litigation. But apart from these four major mechanisms, we do have other mechanisms such as mid up dispute resolution board, dispute resolution advisor, partnering, etc. So various dispute resolution mechanisms are in place. The parties will need to think about which one will be the most appropriate dispute resolution methods for the contract. And second, it's very important to look at forum, which court shall have jurisdiction? And third, which law should apply? That's the issue of applicable law. Choices are tactical choices aimed at minimizing risks associated with cross-border trade and investment. We were always being very careful which court, which law we should choose to, uh, to avoid potential risks, such as arbitration or litigation in unfavorable forum which do not really support arbitration or failed selection of the applicable law. Those applicable law that we choose are not adopted because it's invalid. So there are always some risk and we always have to be very careful. So if the choices fail, then the party's expectations of the bargain are frustrated. So it appears that choice of law and choice of forum are two very important issues. In a cross-border trade and investment, it's obviously important and we will have to make good plan for the choice. The parties can order or structure their bargain to obtain anticipated outcome. Choice provides certainty and predictability which of course can add to the effectiveness of the transaction and lower the costs of transactions and increase its economic viability. Before we enter into any kind of contract, 
normally we will need to assess potential risk so that we can manage risk inherent in cross-border commercial activities. But the transnational background always add in difficulties or complexity. So multi-jurisdictional transactions require parties to consider international dimension of the transaction. In effective or no choice of law increases, parties transaction and litigation risks. That's also the purpose why the HCCH would need to do something to improve the situation. So when it comes to the choice of law issue, we definitely will need to look at the 2015 Hague principles for the international commercial contracts. These documents has very clear objectives. The objective is to make sure the freedom to choose the applicable law in international contractual disputes, the party or court autonomy, the party autonomy has been widely accepted in the international conventions, regional instruments, national codifications, and national case law. This has been well put down in a paper, but we have noticed that party autonomy is not always respected and parties might not always get what they bargain for. So for example, that's one case in Italy, um, uh, the city of Padua. So the, there's a decision of the district court in Padua in 2005, where the parties agreed in a contract for the supply of goods. Uh, with that's the rabbits, uh, that this contract shall be governed by the laws and regulation of the International Chamber of Commerce of Paris, France. So ICC laws shall be the applicable law, but the court held that this could not be intended as a choice of law as party autonomy under the relevant laws did not extend to choosing non-state law. Obviously, ICC is not a country. So there's some kind of different views. In the end, of course, they said this applicable law, applicable law approach, uh, the provision is not valid. Then we have to apply the CISG made by the ANSI trial. So in these case scenarios, the party's choice has not been followed. They decide to use other documents. In view of the, this uh, situation, the HCCH started the work to deal with the hate principle, uh, principles on the choice of law in international commercial contracts. The work started in 2006. The Permanent Bureau conducted a feasibility study and concludes that there's a need to have these type of documents. 2010 to 2011, the working group met on three occasions to prepare the draft articles. 2012, the special commission approved the document. And 2013, the working group meeting, which has been later on uh, um, adopted and also they put in the commentary. So the package consisting of a preamble and 12 articles with introduction and a commentary. Finally, the document was approved in 2005, uh, 15, 2015. So that's the um, HCCH principles on choice of law in international commercial contracts. Uh, and we abbreviated as 2015 hate principles. Uh, from the previous slides, we have already known that the HCCH normally will draft conventions. And we have already 39 conventions and this document is a soft law document. This is the only soft law document that have been developed by the HCCH so far. 
the documents promote party autonomy, although with some limitations. That means it gives the party's chosen law the widest scope of application to be subject to clearly defined limits. We will, of course, look at what are the limits. The first place is that party autonomy is very well respected and will be used in practice. And this kind of arrangement is to strengthen the legal certainty and predictability. And is to be used by law and policy makers, judges, arbitrators, and practitioners. If we look at the preamble, it's quite clear that the general principles concerning choice of law in international commercial contracts, that's a party autonomy with limited exceptions. So this has been very clearly defined in the preamble of the document. It first mentions that these principles may be used as a model for national, regional, supranational, or international instruments. And they may be used to interpret, supplement, and develop rules of private international law. Furthermore, it also mentioned these principles may be applied by courts or by arbitral tribunals. Now we look at a few articles, the most important articles in the Hague Principles. The first one, it clearly defines the scope which applies only to international commercial contracts. It in excludes the consumer and employment contracts. Secondly, it adopts a broad notion of internationality. If we look at the article one, we obviously can find out the scope has been very broad. A contract is international unless the parties have their establishment in the same state and the relationship as parties and all other relevant elements, regardless of the chosen law, are connected only with that state. This broad notion of internationality has been the major approach that have been adopted by the HCCH. Not only in this soft documents, soft law documents, we have used this approach, but later on, if we look at the choice of court convention, actually the definition of internationality is almost the same. So that means we're trying to include many scenarios into this document. The document also applies to a situation where the parties have made a choice of law expressly or tacitly by agreement. If there's no choice of law, obviously it will not be included in the documents. So the 2015 HCCH principles do not address the issue of the applicable law in the absence of choice by the parties. Furthermore, if we look at the scope itself, it does not include the law governing arbitration agreements. The reason is that there's no international uh, consensus whether the question concerning the material validity of the arbitration agreement is a substantive or procedural question. So the hate principles are neutral in this issue. It does not really tell you that arbitration agreements is a substantive issue or procedural issue. That's the first aspect, so it's neutral. It does not really get involved in these controversial issues. Then the choosing the seat of the arbitration can only be indicative of the taxed choice of the proper law made by the parties. It is in itself not a choice of law. That means 
if you choose a place for arbitration, it only plays the role as a one factor when the arbitrator or judge decides on the potential applicable law. It is not itself as a choice of law. Now we move further to look at what kind of laws should be applied, what kind of principles have been included. Article two provides a party autonomy. And if we look at the provision itself, it gives a broadest scope for the party autonomy. First, the two parties have the freedom to choose the applicable law. Different laws can be chosen to govern different parts of the contract. And the two parties can modify the applicable law at any time. The chosen law does not need to have connection with the transaction or the parties. So these four areas or four uh, points actually show that the hate principles really is very flexible gives the party autonomy a widest possibility. Article three, talk about the choice of non-state rules. This is exactly what we have just mentioned about the Italian case. The Hague, Convention, uh, Hague principles basically says, yes, you can choose. So the, um, the rules that are generally accepted on an international, supranational, or regional level, that will be fine. And further, uh, the non-state rules that are a neutral and balanced set of rules, rules, such as the CRSG, which is of course a freestanding set of contract rules, or the UNIDOA principles. The CRSG, I assume uh, all of you know, that the United Nations Convention on the International Sales of Goods. The second, UNIDOA, is another intergovernmental organization which is abbreviated for the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law. So they have all these documents. You can choose. You are free to choose. And furthermore, of course, there will be some limits. So unless the law of the forum provides otherwise, we will still respect the national law. If the national law says, no, you cannot choose non-state rules, then of course the hate principles will not intervene in these um, uh, national uh, situation. Article four provides the express or tacit choice of the applicable law. So it's fine, it doesn't matter whether this has been done expressly in the contract or appear clearly from the contract, that's fine. Although you have not put down the, which law should apply, but if we can judge from those that have, you have put down in a contract or the scenarios, you can decide which law is applicable law that will be accepted or recognized. Article five. Uh, provides that will be no requirement as to the form of the choice of law. So for example, uh, um, it doesn't matter whether the provision on the choice of law is drafted in a particular language. But again, we will say later on, there will be some limits, limitations. If the national law says no, we will not recognize, then the Hague principles will not interfere. Article six, again emphasize about the consent between the parties is essential. We have to make sure that the parties indeed have reached the consensus. But, but how about some scenarios when the two sets of standard forms are conflicting? So article six basically talks about the battle of forms. This article emphasizes about the consent, the consensus that were reached by the two parties. First, the situation where under the purportedly chosen law, 
different standard terms or no standard terms prevail, then there will be no choice of law. So there's no party consent, no party autonomy. Second, the situation where under the purportedly chosen law, the same standard terms prevail. So if under the purportedly chosen law, standard term, which include a choice of law clause are considered to be part of the contract and the agreement on the applicable law is made out, then the law designated in clause governs the main contract. So that means if there's no different views, if they agree that's the only choice, that's the only result, then of course, these terms will apply. That will be considered as applicable law. Other principles in the Hague uh, documents, it mentioned invalidity of the contract does not proceed invalidate the choice of law provision. So there will be some independence. The reference to a substantive law is without conflict of law rules, rather it is not recognized. It only refers to substantive law. Once a law is chosen, selected, then it governs all, including pre-contractual obligations, construction, and validity. And whether the two parties agree to the applicable law will be decided by the purportedly chosen law. So these are the few principles that have been put down in the Hague document. We have mentioned that although we advocate the party autonomy, but there are some limitations, some exceptions. So Article 11 provides that public policy and overriding mandatory rules are the exceptions. So it is regulated in one single provision, that's Article 11. Both should be applied in exceptional circumstances, which include the fundamental norms of the law of forum, the law otherwise applicable, and the law of another state. So public policy and overriding mandatory rules will be used as exception to the party autonomy. Uh, when it comes to the pu public policy, actually the courts and arbitrary tribunals apply slightly different schemes, but in practice, it's rather difficult to draw a line in practice, it's rather difficult. So uh, normally the court will be more strict in applying the public policy. Arbitrary tribunals will have some kind of flexibility, but it, ups to, it, it is normally up to the arbitrator, the arbitral tribunal to view the issue. So that will be a difference, but some, uh, it's rather difficult to summarize at what are the real difference or the specific difference, but we can note the slight difference there. Now, public policy or the mandatory rules are used uh, two examples. One in the, uh, but basically these two examples uh, uh, deal with the linguistic requirements. One in Turkey, the other, uh, fortunately, I found a case in Indonesia. So in Turkey, the law on mandatory use of Turkish by commercial enterprises mentions that foreign companies must use Turkish when conducting transactions and corresponding with their Turkish counterparts or business partners. For foreign companies, the law does not forbid the use of foreign languages, but Turkish version of the document prevail, even if they have not been signed by the respective parties. So they um, uh, cherish more the Turkish language in the contractual arrangements. But in practice, you can see courts have considered agreements between the foreign company and a Turkish company to be invalid if they are drafted in a language other than Turkish and they are performed in Turkey. So you will need to have the Turkish version and failure to comply with the law has civil law consequences and may also result in criminal liability. So the language is one something which have been made mandatory. 
So the party autonomy will have some limits. When we turn to the situation in Indonesia, uh, this is a law uh, in 2009. I'm not too sure whether this law has been amended or not. This law deals with the national flag, language, emblem, and anthem. And it is still enforced, uh, Professor Zhou, until now is still enforced, and uh, the, the, there will be no intention to, to, to withdraw this, 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 uh, this term. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the clarification. When I did research to prepare for the presentation, I just found, oh, this case is quite interesting. Uh, so that's why I put that in this slide, just for your information. Article 31, the MOU contracts or agreements with any location, oh, sorry, whereas any Indonesian entity or person should be in Bahasa, Indonesia. Any MOU contract or agreement involving foreign parties may also be written in natural language of foreign party and or in English. Now in a court in the West Jakarta District Court in 2013, that's a loan agreement governed by Indonesian law is void if drafted in English only which was considered to be in violation of the law. And this case, the decision has been supported or upheld by the Jakarta High Court and the Supreme Court of Indonesia. But I think the question which can, we can raise is that if we choose our law, maybe the judgment can be different. So this basically shows that the applicable law is indeed very important. It can change the result in the end. Now that's a choice of law issue. We move to the choice of forum. For this issue, I will uh, look at the choice of court convention that was made in 2005. The HCCH has a long history of promoting the principle of party autonomy in the area of international trade. We mentioned about the party autonomy includes not only the choice of law, but also the choice of court. So includes the ability of parties to choose a court forum to resolve disputes in international cases, and for that choice to be respected by law. The party's choice of court will generally be expressed in terms of their contract which is known as the choice forum or choice of court agreement or forum selection clause. Uh, the background to have this convention is that actually before the 2005 choice of court convention was made, the ability of parties to choose a court has been recognized in several regional instruments, not at the international level. Uh, regional level, we look at the European Union, uh, we look at the South American countries, and also some uh, former Soviet Union um, uh, countries. So they have some kind of uh, uh, documents which deals with the uh, choice of court. Uh, as a national level, um, some countries still do not recognize the ability of parties to choose a court of that state or another state. So the situation at the time was not very satisfactory. And the HCCH, HCCH realized the need to come up with some documents which deal with the choice of court. The documents, as I said, uh, was concluded in June 2005 at the HCCH 20th session um, and entered into force in 2015, October 2015. Now there are 32 members, including the EU. Uh, the basic objective for this convention are to provide legal certainty and predictability with respect to choice of court agreements, promote access to justice in trade and investment, and become a litigation equivalent of the 1958 New York Convention. Uh, New York Convention basically deals with the recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral award in the area of arbitration. So the choice of court convention has intention to become the litigation equivalent part of the convention. But of course, we noted that this is only the very first step. Later on, we have some other efforts to make the picture more complete, 
more comprehensive, which I will come back very briefly later on. Uh, in the 2012 statement, ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, confirmed that by promoting greater certainty for cross-border business, the convention should create a climate more favorable for international trade and investment. If we look at the convention, the scope, it applies to international cases. For the purpose of the jurisdiction, the definition for internationality, again, the same as I've just mentioned, is very broad, a broad notion. For the purpose of recognition and enforcement, a case is international where the judgment was given in another contracting state. So that's a starting point for the understanding of internationality. Uh, for civil or commercial matters, uh, again, quite similar to what we have discussed, consumer and employment contract are expressly excluded. Furthermore, there are some other issues which are also excluded, including family law, succession, insolvency, carriage of goods and persons, antitrust matters, and validity of intellectual property rights. Furthermore, we can see that this convention applies to exclusive choice of court agreements. The documents in several articles mentioned about the choice of court. So a choice of court agreement designating a single court or the courts of a single state is deemed exclusive unless the parties expressly provides otherwise. So for example, if you mention about West uh, uh, Jakarta uh, court, that will be fine. But for uh, uh, greater China areas, if you say the Chinese court, probably we will have to make it very clear that Hong Kong court or Macau court or mainland Chinese court. So that means a, um, if a single state, that will be good. If not a single state so that with various jurisdictions, then we will have really have to make it clearer. If not, this will not be considered as an exclusive choice of court agreement. However, states may agree by declaration to recognize and enforce judgments rendered pursuant to a non-exclusive choice of court agreement. So it's up to the state to have broad application of the convention. Uh, when it comes to the formality, it must be concluded or documented in writing or by other means of communication, which render information accessible for subsequent reference. This, of course, take into account the electronic uh, form of the signature um, and um, format. Uh, severability, it also talk about the choice of court agreement can be separated from other part of the contract. And it, it basically concluded after entry into force for the state of designated court. The convention provides us three obligations. The key obligations are three. One is the chosen court must hear the dispute. Any non-chosen court must suspend, dismiss proceedings. And finally, a judgment given by the chosen court must be recognized and enforced. First, the chosen court must hear the disputes. That means if the court is chosen, you cannot refuse to hear the dispute because it considers the court of another state is more appropriate or a court of another state was seized first. But the chosen court may refuse to hear dispute where the choice of court agreement is now avoided under the law of that state, including the conflict rules. Furthermore, it does not affect the internal rules on subject matter jurisdiction or venue. So national law, basically, you can decide on your own. Second, non-chosen court must suspend or dismiss the case. But there are also some exceptions or some other scenarios when the court not chosen may hear the disputes. 
but these are very limited circumstances when the non-chosen court can hear the disputes. The choice of court agreement is now an avoid under the law of state of a chosen court, including conflict rules. Second, a party lacked capacity to conclude agreement under the law of state of court ceased. Third, given effect to agreement would lead to manifest injustice or would be manifestly contrary to the public policy of the state of the court ceased. And for exceptional reason beyond the control of the parties, the agreement cannot reasonably be performed or the chosen court has decided not to hear the case. So these are the few scenarios when the non-chosen court may hear the dispute. And finally, that the third key obligations regarding the recognition and enforcement, the court may refuse to recognize and enforce a judgment in a falling circumstances. One is regarding the agreement is now and void under the law of state of chosen court or the party lacked capacity the defendant was not properly notified or the judgment was obtained by fraud. So that's a few scenarios when the judgment can be rejected for recognition or refused for recognition and enforcement. Furthermore, there are some other scenarios. So if the recognition and enforcement will be manifestly incompatible with public policy of requesting states, the judgment is inconsistent with a judgment given in the requested state in a dispute between the same parties, or that's inconsistency between the current judgment and the earlier judgment. For the, of course, will be between the same party and involve the same course of action. So these are the scenarios the courts can refuse to recognize and enforce the judgment. Obviously, these few scenarios or situations focus more on the procedural aspect. So in a way, the choice of court convention in 2005 is quite straightforward. And that is one of the most important achievements that have been made by the HCCH in the field of uh, uh, judgment project. This is not enough. So the HCCH obviously will need to move forward. The convention deals with the exclusive choice of court. Now we have the principles regarding the choice of court. We respect party autonomy, but there are also situations when there's no exclusive choice of court. So that's why the HCCH continues the work to deal with the judgment issue. The second step is the 2019 Judgment Convention. So the Judgment Convention here does not deal with the choice forum. I mainly pick up this slide to give you a whole picture. So the 2019 Judgment Convention with the same objective to enhance access to justice for all and to promote international trade and investment and mobility. And it does this by ensuring meaningful judgments, reducing duplicate proceedings, reducing costs and timeframes and allowing informed choices. Now the 2005 and 2019 conventions, they are very closely related. They share the same goals, which I have just mentioned, access to justice, bring certainty and predictability, and to facilitate cross-border trade and investment for transnational um, uh, scenarios from the transnational perspective. But also we, of course, noted very close 
relationship between these two conventions because yes because these two conventions are complementary so the former one deals with the exclusive choice court the 2019 convention deals with non-exclusive choice of court furthermore these conventions are largely aligned differences were made with justified reasons so these are very closely connected now we move to our my last slide we have two steps already 2005 2019 conventions we will need to look at other issues that is the jurisdiction project which is ongoing the hcch assess the feasibility desirability and necessity of developing a new instrument on the jurisdiction issue. And it has been considered to be necessary. So it tries to resolve the following two issues. On which grounds can a state exercise jurisdiction in civil and commercial matters? And how can harmonize rules in this area reduce the risk of parallel litigation in multiple states. So the work is ongoing. We do not really have a um, confirmed answer yet, but I think it's useful and interesting to see the ongoing work. So that's something I would like to discuss with you today. Uh, as you can see that I focus on the choice of law and choice of forum through the discussion of the 2015 uh, hate principles on choice of law in international commercial contracts and the 2005, the choice of court convention. And I move a little bit further to look at the ongoing work that has been done by the HCCH, which I very briefly touched upon the 2019 convention and also the jurisdiction project so that you can have a fuller picture about the work that are ongoing in the field of private international law. So with this, I conclude my presentation and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I pass the floor back to the chair. Thank you, Professor Zhou, for your presentation. It's quite uh, comprehensive and you have presented uh, your presentation systematically and can be easily understood by our student. And uh, I think uh, before we are moving to the Q&A sessions, uh, for the purposes for the uh, documentation, uh, we would like to invite all the participants to uh, turn on the camera before we, we are going to take the picture together and perhaps uh, Patofik uh, could lead us. Professor Zhou, this is uh, for our documentation session. Uh, I think there are more than 200 participants right now. Oh, sorry, 191 uh, participants that has been joined with us. And I think this is uh, the time for us to, to, to take the picture together. And Patofik, perhaps you can lead us. And for the, the participant, uh, please uh, turn on your camera. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Marshall. I will let the, the, the technical. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Yunso. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, please, the participant, please turn on your camera. I will uh, starting to take the pictures. And in my pictures, uh, in my screen, there is a three different screens. So I will begin from the first screen on my mark one. Two, three. Okay, and the second screen on my mark. One, two, three. And the last screen on my mark. One, two, three. Uh, I think the photo session has been properly done. I will back my button to Mr. Musal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taufik, for your time. Okay, uh, now we are moving to the Q&A session. Professor Zhou, uh, uh, I, uh, I would like to, to, to remind the participant, you may raise the question by raising hand or uh, you can use a, a chat to everyone to, 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 to text your, your question to the Professor Zhou. 
fortunately there are so many participants that want to raise the question directly to you professor zo perhaps the first one we will give the screen to wait let me see has been joined with us with uh, Mr. Rizky Adi, Adi Wilaga, perhaps Pak Rizky, uh, you uh, can uh, ask the question directly to the Professor Zhou. Uh, the, the screen is yours right now. Uh, still unmute, Pak Rizky. Okay. Okay, now uh, we have... Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Mr. Mursa, uh, good morning, uh, Professor Yun Zhao. Uh, it is a very honor to uh, to have a lecture from you. And first of all, I would like to thank the uh, Faculty of Law, Bajajan University, Transpecies Law, uh, which uh, hold this uh, lecture about the international private law. Well, uh, I would like to uh, ask a question to you. Well. My name is Rizky Adwilaga. I'm, my background is a uh, intellectual property lawyer and I also a corporate lawyer. So I have been practicing as a legal practitioner for more than 20 years. So it is quite interesting to hear what you are uh, uh, delivered today about the uh, choice of law and choice of forum. Because uh, actually I have uh, been experienced uh, dealing with the, that issue. The first issue is about the uh, procedural law. During the case, when I uh, handled the case uh, a few years ago, when the 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 the, uh, the, 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 the uh, sorry the case uh, between the Indonesian entity and then also uh, with the other foreign entity, and then the second one is about the uh, two parties uh, among Indonesian. Entity, uh, legal entity, and also the forest entity, uh, MNA. Uh, uh, and then the second issue is about the, uh, the choice of forum has had been made uh, by the both parties, but uh, but the ones of the parties uh, filed uh, legal law a lawsuit to the Jakarta DC court. So it is against the the choice of law and choice of forum. Sorry. So. Uh, both of uh, issue has already under, uh, already uh, settled uh, uh, a few years ago, but there is a current situation that I would like to have your opinion, uh, Professor Yu Zhao. Uh, this is about uh, where we are uh, understand we, we understand about the commercial issue of the interest of private law, but today in Indonesia current situation, also there is possibility the university. Uh, uh, Every single university in Indonesia could make a cooperation uh, a, a agreement with the other entity uh, from the other countries. Let's say uh, in the regional situation among the uh, country in ASEAN. So uh, the cooperation agreement mainly about the uh, research, research of the joint of research between uh, two universities from the many uh, countries with the one or two uh, Indonesian and uh, university. So the question, uh, a few weeks ago, I have a very interesting uh, issue. When the one of the uh, university from Singapore uh, has an uh, ongoing negotiation with the Indonesian university, so they put uh, in Singapore a draft, uh, so the draft coming, uh, uh, is coming from the Singapore university. So they put in choice of law and choice of forum, the Singapore law to be implemented. And then also the choice of forum also in Singapore. Uh, I, 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 I forgot about the uh, court or maybe the SIEC, uh, Singapore International Business Center would be uh, as a forum. So when we, uh, when the University of Indonesia tried to negotiate uh, to put the Indonesian law as a choice of law, because the, the, objects, the object of the Corporate agreement research is a, a place in Indonesia, so they refuse. They they seem refuse, and then they put also 
No, we don't want to change the choice of law and choice of forum. So they put Hong Kong law as the choice of uh, forum and choice of law. So in my opinion, because the object, the object of the agreement uh, is Indonesia, mainly 90%, 99% Indonesia. So according to the, my understanding about interest of private law is there is a, a principle of the most characteristic connection. So the most characteristic connection is Indonesia. So usually we choose Indonesian law to uh, settle of the uh, issue, but the choice, uh, so we trade off as a lawyer, I usually trade off law. So Indonesian law is choice of law, but the choice of forum would be uh, uh, try to, uh, to to find another accord. So uh, this new entities, Rizky, this is not sorry uh, to, to yes. interrupt you uh, because yes. we have limited yes, yes, time. Yes. Perhaps you can okay. directly okay. Uh, okay. Your, your point. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you, Fatwasal. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so I would like to have uh, your opinion. Is this a common uh, in? University and university, according to your experience, uh, would be also choice of law and choice forum. Choice of law and choice of forum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rinzo. Uh, I'm so sorry, Pak Mursa, because I had to explain first to Mr. Rinzo. Okay, no worries, thank, you. Uh, risky. thank you. Professor Zhou, uh, do you prefer to answer the first question first, or we can give the opportunity for other students to, to raise questions? Perhaps you can conclude all the questions and uh, answer it uh, all together. Uh, uh, I think uh, right now uh, we also have uh, three students that has been uh, raised uh, their hands. The first one that there is Queen Nasha. Uh, Queen Nasha is our student. He right now is uh, taking uh, international contract law uh, and any other uh, subject from uh, Department of Transnational Business Law. Uh, and Queen Nasha, this is your time to 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 ask the question to the professor. So this is the screen is yours. Okay, thank you, Pamursal. Uh, hello, Professor Inzo. My name is Kunasha. So I usually found on the dispute resolution clause that only determines the seat of arbitration and venue of arbitration. My question is, what is the difference between choice of forum, choice of law, and choice of jurisdiction? Is it the same with the concept of seat of arbitration and venue of arbitration? Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Kunasha. Mm. I think, uh, Professor Zhou, I think we, we uh, participant to give the question first, and after that, we will uh, open the second session. And uh, perhaps right now, uh, we have Darian. Uh, Darian, also the student from the Transnational Business Law Department, Professor Zhou. This is also uh, is taking uh, international contract and also any other subject from uh, our department. And for Darian, the the, floor, uh, the the screen is yours. Okay. Uh, good morning, Professor. Uh, I'm very interested in the 2015 Hague principles. Uh, you explained earlier that in determining the choice of law, the HCCH may take into account the tacit choice of law of the parties. Uh, my question is: uh, Does the HCCH uh, provide a certain method? For interpreting the party's intent of whether or not they have tacitly cho chosen the a specific national law. Thank you. Okay, I think this is the first session, Professor Zhou. Perhaps you can respond to the old question. Okay, uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. I think the three excellent questions. Uh, now I come to the first one. Uh, first one, I think is quite, quite interesting. I think we talk about the choice of law issue, uh, but of course that will be two, largely two steps. Uh, um, first one is ex exclusive choice of law. That means the two parties will have the opportunity to negotiate between themselves to come up with uh, applicable law uh, between themselves. So this will be respected in the first place. If the two parties fail to reach any kind of agreement on applicable law, then we will have to decide which law will be applicable law. And you have correctly pointed out that uh, we, uh, if there's no uh, contractual arrangements uh, regarding applicable law, we can actually use the uh, closest connection point. That means we, if we have not choose any law, then we will look at other factors to decide what will be the applicable law. So for example, the high percentage of the shares in uh, Indonesia and also other factors, the conclusion of the contract 
etc. So all these happened in Indonesia. The judge or the arbitrator will most probably will decide, oh, this will be the applicable law, Indonesian law, not the Singaporean law or the Hong Kong law. But in general, uh, if the two parties have uh, concluded the agreement, which in contains the provisions on applicable law, we, according to the 2015 uh, hate uh, principles, we will respect the uh, choice of law, the applicable law, unless we can, uh, th this uh, provision is void or invalid, then we will move to the next step regarding the closest connection or other factors to take into account. So that's a normal approach to decide on the choice of law. Uh, indeed, I think that during the negotiation, uh, Hong Kong, uh, 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 Indonesian party might insist on the use of uh, uh, Indonesian law. The Singaporean party might insist on the use of Singapore, uh, Singaporean law. If the negotiation, fails, they could not reach consensus on the applicable law. Infrequent, not infrequently, the two parties will say, okay, we will try to use a third uh, uh, law of the third country, the neutral country. So that will be the way out. So for example, uh, not only in the choice of law, but also in a choice of forum, uh, we are not going to uh, uh, take the arbitration in Indonesia. We are not going to take the arbitration in Singapore. Then we try to find a third neutral place, probably Hong Kong or in Europe. So that's the way I uh, think that uh, frequently happens uh, during the negotiation process. So that's my response to the uh, qu your question. Uh, now um, I move to the second. Regarding the differences between choice of law and choice of forum, these two issues uh, actually are uh, in a way uh, related or closely related. Sometimes if you have made choice of law, a choice of uh, forum, probably you will have some, some ideas on choice of law. I said, I choose the Indonesian um, uh, court then I probably will indirectly says, oh, I will choose a choice of law. That's the Indonesian law. That could be, uh, that means the place, the venue, if, if you choose, and you have no applicable law provisions in the contract, the judge will have to decide oh, which law should apply. Then the judge will look at, oh, you choose the Indonesian court, you uh, choose to use Indonesian language, and you have all these connections with the uh, Indonesian in Jakarta. Then uh, we decide that the Indonesian law is the uh, most uh, closely connected. So in that sense, the choice of forum is equivalent to the choice of law that in that scenario. But we also need to know the differences between the choice of law and choice of forum. You can decide that I would like to choose Hong Kong law, but I would like to choose the forum in Jakarta. So that these two are in, to a certain extent can be related, but not the same. Uh, the venue can be only one factor to consider about the choice of law. So that's something uh, I would like to mention about the differences or the similarities between the two. For the last question regarding the 2015 principles for the interpretation, I think that will be rather important. First of all, if we really put down the, uh, uh, the provisions there, uh, you, we basically will say, oh, what kind of laws you have chosen for interpretation? Again, the same, you can have applicable law put down in a contract. If not, then the judge will have to decide, oh, which law should apply? Uh, probably it was, oh, the whole contract use English law. Then we should also use English law. But you can, of course, put down clearly in the paper saying, we are not using, the English law only apply to other parts of the contract. We are using Indonesian law to interpret. So uh, that's the, the main functions of the 2015 principle, which uh, says that the contract can be divided into several different parts. The law can apply to different parts of the contract. So I hope I've answered the three questions, uh, but I will be very happy to see if uh, uh, some questions I have not answered satisfactory, I can follow up. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, no worries, uh, Professor Zhou. Unfortunately, uh, we also received a question from the chat box. This is from uh, 
Dr. Bayu Seto. The, uh, for your information, Professor Zhou, Dr. Bayu Seto is the, the prominent expert in private international law in, in Indonesia. Is the lecturer from the Parahyangan University. Uh, before I, 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 I read this the question, perhaps uh, Pak Bayu, uh, would you prefer to, to, raise, uh, to, to, to deliver your question directly or uh, I just uh, read it? Uh, are you still in tune yes. with us? Uh, okay, uh, I will read it. Uh, uh, thank you, Pa Musa. Uh, dear Professor Cho, it's a pleasure uh, to hear from you again. Uh, my question was uh, concerning the uh, cho choice of law principles. So my question is like this. What was the rationale behind the HCGH choice of law principles to provide unlimited freedom to choose the applicable law and contracts, regardless to any substantial connection between the chosen law and the parties or the contract. That's uh, what, what I'm afraid of, or rather concern is, uh, would that kind of provision encourage choice of law to avoid some mandatory or public policies of, of the putative proper law of the said contract. Uh, uh, this become a discussion between uh, within uh, the Indonesian uh, leg legisl legislatures uh, when we are uh, drafting the bill, the private international law bill uh, uh, in uh, up under the Ministry of uh, uh, Justice and uh, Human Rights. And they, uh, this become a, a debate whether we should uh, adopt the free unlimited uh, freedom to choose uh, the the applicable law or we should uh, some somewhat restrict that to a certain uh, connections and and uh, because uh, uh, we are concerned that it, it is possibility uh, encourage uh, uh, private parties to to avoid mandatory rules by choosing uh, uh, some irrelevant legal system or uh, uh, rules uh, which avoid the mandatory or uh, public policy of the proper law of the contract. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, should I answer now? Uh, yeah, perhaps uh, for this session, you, you, you may respond to the uh, question raised by Papa Yu. Yeah, uh, uh, many thanks. I think very honored to receive this uh, uh, question and uh, good to see you, I think, uh, on this very special occasion. I think you raised a very valid point, I think very uh, useful and important issue. Um, uh, we, uh, we are going to choose laws but some laws are, have nothing to do with the contract, has nothing to do with two, two parties. What's the point of uh, allowing this kind of arrangement? Now, if we look at the background for the negotiation of the uh, HCCH principles, the purpose the, uh, at the time was to recognize the principle of a party autonomy as much as possible. So uh, mm -hmm. we do not really care which law you should choose, uh, but uh, as long as you choose, we respect your will. So that's a rationale as at, uh, at that time. But later on, of course, we have put down that we also need to respect the mandatory rules at the national level and also public policies. So that means uh, the status or at that time was that we respect the party autonomy as much as possible, but with limitations, with limits. The limits lies in the public policy or the mandatory rules at the national level. So that's something they have a consensus. That means the national circumstance work is still the most important. Uh, different countries, can, uh, they can still put on as a national laws regarding what will be mandatory. We, uh, you cannot uh, violate. I still remember in the mainland China, uh, there are also some uh, limits regarding the uh, applicable law, which should have some kind of connections with the transactions, et cetera. They have already been there, but in the future, we do not know. They are still looking to whether there's a possibility to extend a bit more or not. Uh, but, but if we decide, oh, this really uh, will be, uh, bring in some adverse scenarios or uh, consequences, then the state can decide, okay, we will put down as mandatory rules. Uh, the 
adverse consequences can include uh, a certain limit, a falling law. We do not know if you choose a law which is unknown to the parties, unknown to the judges, that how can we determine in the end, the court of the forum, they will have to decide to use their own law. We cannot find any, this kind of foreign law. We, there's no way for us to ascertain the contents of the foreign law. So there's no point for you to choose that law. So that's why uh, I think the uh, 2015 HCCH principle means to give as much as possibility to party autonomy, but limitations part leaves to the members countries, member states to decide whether they would like to put in some limits or not. Uh, and I believe that quite a lot of countries uh, um, have already have these kind of uh, limitations in their national legal regime. And there's nothing wrong, although I think there are always some arguments say there's no point to limit the choice of law, but we do see some problem, uh, possible ad adverse consequences that may come up later on. So I think that's something I can respond to your um, excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you, so, Professor Shaw. Thank, thank you, Pamurcha. Thank you, Pabayu, for your time that doing with us. And now we have three uh, last questions. Professor Zhou, uh, it is uh, from um, Labib Wajdi. Labib, this is uh, your time to, to, to raise your question directly to the Professor Zhou. The screen is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Morsal. Uh, good afternoon <laughs> from Indonesia. I don't know if you're from another time zone there, uh, Mr. Zhao. Um, I actually want to ask two questions. Uh, first one is that seeing that according to Article 31 of uh, law, num uh, law number 24 of 2009, which is part of our Indonesian law, it is said that agreements must be made using Bahasa Indonesia in order to be legitimate. Now, my first question is, has this system of using national languages as the only legitimate uh, language in a contract a trend among countries or, are, or is Indonesia an outlier actually? And the second question is that seeing that globalization and you know, uh, boost, what do they call this, uh, the, the, the global trade, uh, would you argue that accommodating contracts in English, I mean, in terms of Indonesia as a state, would, would that be a, a move in the right direction? I also have several questions in uh, according to, uh, Regarding arbitration, however, seeing that Tamusa will cut me on uh, if if I went on for too long, maybe if I can, I can contact you one on one later. That's for me. Uh, me. Can you repeat the second question? I didn't really pick up. I think regarding the global aspect. <laughs> sorry. Oh uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a quite fast talker. Essentially, what I'm asking here is that seeing that the system that we have now is that in order to make a contract legitimate, you have to make it in Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, and right now we're living in the 21st century, you know, globalization, uh, global, global trade, the economic is growing. Don't you think make, uh, changing the regulation from only allowing Bahasa Indonesia to also allow English uh, to make a uh, contract legitimate, wouldn't that be a, a move in the right direction, according to you? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Labib. Uh, Professor Zhou, this is uh, right what uh, Labib uh, mentioned. This is uh, quite uh, problematic in Indonesia itself. Yeah, on the one hand, we want to 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 uh, uh, invite the investor to to coming to Indonesia, and uh, you know that this uh, provision regarding to the compulsory to use bahasa in the contract, and sometimes they must make the contract in bilingual, not only in 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 bahasa in in English, but also they must uh, uh, translate it into into bahasa. Perhaps you can respond the, the, to to the to the uh, labib question or. Uh, I would add some question, perhaps uh, still regarding to the question: Is there any any country that 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 follow in Indonesia path to that 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 want to 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 prevail national language uh, uh, for uh, the, the, the 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 contract itself? Yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, okay, so probably I answer the question first, right? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a very interesting question. I think I didn't realize. I think the language uh, or linguistic uh, thing issues. I think really come come up. I think uh, uh, that's also, uh, of course. I think my initial research. I think I realized. I think of very interesting cases. I think that happened. I think uh, well in the uh, Islamic countries or uh, yeah. um, 
uh, that the something I think we realize. Uh, I think from the examples I uh, found out, I think not only in the Turkey, uh, not only in Indonesia, but also sometimes in Italy, they also have the similar cases that are coming up. Uh, so that's why I think, uh, uh, as I've mentioned, that uh, the court, the judge or arbitrators, they might have uh, different views regarding the uh, public policy or mandatory rules in the uh, real cases. Uh, for the linguistic requirement, some countries or some scholars might argue this is one very important issue, and that really belongs to the public policy uh, areas. Uh, but there are also different views regarding this belong belongs to the international public policy or national public policy, that's the international level or uh, national level. Uh, this will also have some impact. That means the judge the arbitrators in dealing with the linguistic requirements, they will uh, probably have different standards to uh, consider. Uh, some uh, scholars argue that linguistic requirements re uh, refers to, uh, belongs to the national level. Uh, they cannot be used in the transnational cases or international cases. We international cases or transnational cases, we only look at the a public policy at the international level. So that's a different uh, arguments or views. But of course, I think uh, I agree that the national level of the public policy is still very important. If you would like to apply for recognition and enforcement in the national court, the national laws, national regime will take up a very important role. So that has been uh, confirmed. Um, if we look at the countries, I think I do not really have a, a full list of countries that really put down the requirements of the language. The language. But I do for look at some example countries for China. Uh, um, now we do not really put down the Chinese um, uh, language as uh, the barrier, uh, but we probably put down uh, these two versions can have uh, equal uh, validity. Uh, so that's the way. Uh, different countries they might put on in different uh, different ways of uh, uh, the linguistic requirement, and then of course you can put on uh, if this um, has something to do with the foreign element. We put on the English language could be uh, the way out, but not necessary. I think I understand. I think when I uh, w was a still uh, student, I think in the two or three, uh, well, many years back in the Netherlands, I met quite a lot of the Indonesian students there and they can speak very good Dutch. They said oh, because of very close relationship with the Netherlands. So that's why I think the Dutch language become also very important. Uh, English is only one language. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it becomes more very, very international. You can say we put on in our national laws, English requirements. I, but this also has some political implications or other implications. I don't really think now you will say the English language will be the best way out. I have some doubts, uh, but of course, uh, in practice, you can say, oh, it's good, uh, because now you speak English, I speak English. Uh, if you uh, put on Dutch, uh, of course, I, I can only use very simple Dutch. I cannot read very freely. So I think that's why I think we still need to lose, uh, well, maintain our culture, uh, maintain our religion, maintain our racial background. I think that's most important, uh, not simply just move to uh, the international or uh, or English language, etc. But for the transnational or globalized world, I agree. I think this is rather important for the trans international transaction, trans communications. This really bring in a lot of convenience. Um, but it depends on the areas that you are looking at global, but you also regionalization. Uh, we also look at European Union. They do not really have a, a rule saying we only use English. They actually also put the 17 language at equal footing. So that's why uh, I think uh, whether this part is the understand, understanding of the public policy issue or the English language issue, I think in a way, I think uh, we have to deal with it more cautiously, uh, taking into account our own national background. I think national religion, national culture will play a lot important role. Uh, that's my understanding. I hope you have answered the three questions uh, uh, raised by both of you, I hope. Okay, thank you, Professor Zhu, for your response to the lab question. And now we have uh, Gregory Joshua and uh, Adiana. Perhaps this is the last question, Prof, uh, of, 
for the first, uh, we give an opportunity for the Gregory Joshua to raise your question to Professor. So the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Morsal. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Zhou. Uh, so uh, my question is uh, quite fundamental because I'm only a fifth semester student in transnational department and international contract is something uh, new for me because uh, previously I used to learn about uh, conventions. So it is uh, between states and learning private international law uh, comes into a struggle for me. Uh, Professor is also, what I'm trying to ask is, what are the difficulties since you are uh, one of the members of the uh, HCCH, which are also uh, made several legal instruments uh, to make a unified private international law instrument? Because uh, in one our in one of our prominent professors in Indonesia, Mr. Sudar Gautama, it is stated in his book that it is very hard to uh, unify all of the uh, instruments from several legal systems uh, to be one uh, unified uh, private international law instruments. Because uh, if I uh, may uh, share my point of view from international law, uh, in international law, when there is a convention, then the parties who are ratified that, that convention will bound to it. And in uh, private international law, it is again has to be chosen uh, by the parties to govern uh, such contracts. So uh, why is it very difficult for international organization to formulate or to uni unify uh, to, or to make a unified legal systems of private international law? Thank you. Right, Professor Zhu, we will give opportunity for the last question from Adiana. After that, you can respond it all together. Okay, Adiana, this screen is yours. Thank you very much, Pak Mursal. Uh, good afternoon, Prof. Zhao. So I would like to ask questions. Uh, it is regarding about the choosing of forum, uh, whether there is a guidance or suggestions for parties that would like to meet a contract for choosing the forum. As I was a little bit concerned if a forum with a different situation law the judge probably needs to learn the chosen law by the parties. And my concern whether it is wise or not to settle the dispute while the judges was barely studied the chosen law by the parties. And of course, the judges is experts on law, but not absolutely experts on the foreign state law. That is my question. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think these two are very important questions and, and a very good question, I must say. Uh, let me come to the first question. I think the difficulties in the unification of instruments uh, in, of the, in a different, uh, with all these different uh, jurisdictions with different legal system. Uh, I fully agree with you. I think the whole process has been uh, rather difficult to unify. Uh, in a way, uh, in a way, uh, I would not like uh, would not like to use the term of unification because I, I believe it's so difficult. Uh, yeah, sometimes I use uh, harmonization. I think that appears to be more easier. Uh, so that's something I think for the first point I would like to mention. Uh, second, um, I am um, again, I think uh, at the international level, there are three organizations which are working towards the harmonization and or the unification of law rules. Uh, apart from the Hague Conference on Private International Law, we also have UNCITRAL, that's the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, and also the UNIDOA, the, that's the International Institute for the Unification of a Private Law. So three institutions are working in this field. Uh, I uh, personally, I think probably the unification of a substantive law will be even more difficult. Uh, it touches on the substantive rights, the rights and duties of the parties. So um, it will be difficult uh, to a certain extent uh, for the harmonization or unification of a private international law rules appears to be feasible, uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, so you just tell us, I think, how you choose the law, then we were looking to uh, the applicable law. 
uh, but again, I think uh, in the international society, we have more than 100 countries. Uh, it's rather difficult to uh, really unify or harmonize. The negotiation indeed takes a long time. We can see the one project probably take uh, 10 years, 20 years to come up with some results, convention. Uh, so that's why I think we really, I think, can see the difficulty and we will see how to reconcile the differences in among different legal systems. Uh, we have the civil Civil law the jurisdictions, common law jurisdictions, Islamic law jurisdictions, etc. Arabic countries, uh, etc. We uh, have already uh, considered what are the difference. If there are any room for us to reconcile, so I think indeed I agree is uh, is difficult. So uh, my last point is that that's also why the international organizations, these three organizations, through the uh, use three different approach to harmonize the rules. One is conventions that of course will be binding and um, a hard law. Second, we also use a model law. Uh, give you the model, you can adopt yourself. That's one, that's a second way. The third way is that we have some uh, soft law documents, the technical notes or some other documents for you to have some guidance. So that's why we realize the difficulty. So that's why we are flexible in adopting approach in harmonization and unification. So that's my answer to your question. Now I move to the next question regarding the choice of forum and choice of law. You are using the law different from the forum. So as a judge, of course, might, I'm sure the judge are not able to know the laws of 100 countries. So that will be one major issue. Uh, and I agree with you, but we should note that uh, it depends on how do we view the applicable law, uh, because there are different views. Some country will say the law, the applicable law belongs to law, the nature of law. That means a judge, you will need to search. You will get, have the duty to find the law. If the judge have difficulty, then of course, the judge might say, oh, I can only use the law of, of the forum. I really cannot find the law. So that's one way, that's one way. The second is that uh, um, several, some countries will think that the applicable law belongs to fact. That means the two parties will have to really um, provide evidence to say this is a law, this is applicable law. So the judge will of course be neutral to hear the evidence a statement from the two parties to decide what will be the law, what will be the rule. If the two parties cannot uh, present evidence, of, of course, the judge will say, okay, now we have no choice. We only use the law of the fallen state. So I think that will be the way to look at the choice of law by the parties. Okay, thank you, Professor Zhu, for your response to all the questions raised, not only for our students, but also for the participant. Uh, that joined with us from the uh, Zoom meeting to this. And Professor Zhou, two hours is not enough for us to discuss such a broad and quite, uh, uh, I think, dynamic issues on the choice of court and H CCH uh, issues. And unfortunately, uh, we still, uh, uh, we do, do not have time to discuss more because uh, our students still have another class that they need to join. And before uh, we come to the end of the sessions, uh, our head of department, uh, Dr. Prita Malia SHMH, will uh, deliver his close, uh, her, uh, the, uh, closing remarks for the today public lectures. To Ibu Prita, uh, the screen is yours, book. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Pak Morsal, to moderate uh, this uh, very wonderful sessions, and of course, thank you very much for Professor Zhou uh, to join with us and also come virtually to our uh, university. Uh, and thank you for the lecture. Always, uh, like Pak Mursal said, always interesting to talk about the uh, choice of law and choice of forum. Of course, in this uh, very globalization era, uh, and also in the, uh, the, the, the development of the transactions, uh, foreign direct investment, and also a global trade. Uh, we are from the Transnational Business Law Department. Would like to uh, thank you and appreciate for your uh, this opportunity for us to have you in our class. And of course, thank you for all the lecturers who joined with us as well. Uh, there's uh, Ibu Dr. Sonny Dewi as uh, head of the department from uh, civil law. 
uh, and together with all the students from the private international law and all the lecture from the private international law class. For your information, the private international law is a su compulsory subject in our faculty. And of course, this is one of the subjects that will be very important to learn about the transnational business law issue. And here we are also would like to thank you for all the participants, our alumni, Pak Rizky, and also Pak Dr. Bayu Seto. He is a head of the Association of Private International Law Lecture. Uh, Indonesia, who is now currently uh, the, uh, together with the government to ha have a law for the private international law. Uh, and also all the students uh, from the Faculty of Law. In, and of course, if there's a student and lecture from the other university in Indonesia. Uh, I really uh, enjoy the sessions with Prof. Zo, and hopefully you are also enjoy the sessions with our students, response all the uh, questions. Hopefully this not the only uh, the session with you, would be there's another session with you in the next semester and would be very a good start for our collaboration between the HCCH and also the Faculty of Law Universitas Pajajaran. As an appreciation, we would like to extend the certificate of appreciation from our dean from, for Professor Zhou. Thank you very much, Prof. Zhou. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's really a great honor for me to have the opportunity and I think, I hope, I think really, I think this is only a start. I think we will have the opportunity, I think, to work together in the near future. So, terima kasih. Terima kasih, Prof. Zo, for the opportunity. Once again, thank you very much for all the participants and looking forward to welcome you again in the next session from the Transnational Business Law Department. I thank you so much. And back to you, Pak Mursa. And Finally, we come to the end of this event, and uh, thank you once again, Professor Zhou, for your time, for your insight, for your knowledge that you share for our students. Hopefully, it will be useful for them in dealing with uh, these issues. And uh, thank you uh, for your coming and attention for all the participants. We look forward to seeing you at another uh, event held by our department, and wish you all a pleasant day. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you, Prof. Zou. Yeah, bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Professor Zou. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zou. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Terima kasih Pak Taufik, Pak Taufik sudah hadir. Terima kasih Bu Sony. Terjang Ibu Berita, suksesnya. Nohon, nohon Bu. Ya, assalamualaikum. Ya. Pak Taufik terima kasih ya, selalu setia hadir. Kang Kiki, hatur nuhun, Bapak Ibu semua, hatur nuhun, teman-teman mahasiswa, terima kasih Pak Mursal, Pak Taufik, dari yang thanks. Rian, 